showing up so early this morning. I know that these uh, the 9 a.m. sessions aren't the easiest ones to make it to. So thanks for coming to hang out with me so so early this morning. Uh, like Naphne said, my name is Nathan Reimnitz. Uh, online, I go by a little less uh, German and, and easier to spell, uh, Nathan Ella. Um, and, and before you get to know really anything about me, I kind of have a, a, a small confession uh, to make here. Uh, so for those of us, or for those of you watching on, on WordPress TV, eventually we're we're at WordCamp uh, Vancouver right now, obviously. Uh, and, and just by a quick show of hands, you know, how many of you in the audience uh, live here somewhere in Canada? Sure, just about everybody, exactly as I expected. Um, and and on my way here, um, well, I guess I should backtrack. Uh, how many of you are familiar uh, with with the, the current exchange rate uh, between the U.S. dollar and the Canadian dollar? Right, probably just about everybody. Uh, maybe not quite. So uh, on my way here, uh, I realized that I had written this in, in, entire session based off the U.S. dollar. I'm I'm from the states, right? And, and so I just kind of wanted to preface this. Uh, it, it could be a little underwhelming if I <laughs> if I didn't share with you that uh, I'm talking mainly about the U.S. dollar uh, here. Um, so for anyone that's not familiar uh, with the exchange rate, it, we'll just do some, some simple math here, right? Uh, and, and I'm not here to, to uh, teach a 9 a.m. Uh, math class, um, but uh, I just want to share this with you briefly in, in case you're not uh, familiar with the, the current exchange rate. Uh, okay, so uh, enough math. Uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, I've been developing websites for, uh, for the last 10 years or so. Um, and when I first got started, the projects that I worked on you know, were, were Dreamweaver and Flash. Um, and as the years moved on uh, or went on, I, I, I made the transition over to, to Joomla. Uh, and then um, if we fast forward a few more years, uh, I, I came to WordPress. Right? Uh, and I've worked uh, over the last 10 years as, as both a, a freelancer um, as well as a few real jobs. Uh, at least that's what my parents called them, right? building websites uh, from a desk, 9 to 5. Uh, for, for various uh, creative agencies throughout the United States. But today, I don't have a, a, a real job. And what I mean by that is, is I'm not building the websites from someone else's desk, 9 to 5 anymore. Right? I'm a, a full-time freelancer. And, and so that means I, just, I earn my living uh, helping clients solve their WordPress problems uh, for, from the comfort of, of my own home. Uh, and like many of you, I assume, even when I'm not uh, getting paid to sit in front of the computer, you'd probably still find me there anyways. Uh, it's something I'm passionate about in my spare time is, is developing uh, iOS or, or iPhone games. Uh, so I've got a couple games on the App Store, and, and uh, I enjoy building those as well. Uh, but enough about me, let's uh, talk about why, why I'm here. Uh, so, first off, uh, by a quick show of hands, how many of you have earned at least some money uh, over the last 12 months as a, as a freelancer, right, in, in any capacity? So whether you're a designer, a developer, a social media expert, photographer, right? Um, it, it looks like just about everyone, or, or an overwhelming majority of us, have, have earned some money uh, as, a, as a freelancer over the last 12 months. Uh, Let's try one more. This is this is the last one, guys. I, I promise. Um, <laughs> but raise your hand if, at any point over the last 12 months, uh, you've had a real job, right? A, a designer, developer, social media expert, copywriter, burger flip, or whatever. Okay, uh, keep your hands up uh, for a minute for me. And, and <clears throat> um, would you have any interest in in learning how to earn more money? Right, uh, to solve the same or, or similar problems and, and, and gain more freedom over your schedule. Right, Put your hands down if you'd be interested in that. Sure. Uh, everybody. Everybody here, right? <laughs> I, I'm no exception to this rule either. Uh, my hand is down too. So uh, if you'd asked me this same question a, a year ago, I would have probably been the first guy in the room with my hand down. You would have heard my hand go down from across the room. I mean, you're telling me uh, you've got a recipe for success in which I can say, solve the same uh, or similar problems, uh, but earn more money and have more control over my schedule. Well, that, that recipe sure sounds like it could change the trajectory of, of my life. So uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm listening. So, so that's why I, I'm here today. Uh, I'm here to share with you some of the, the tips, tricks, uh, and strategies that, that I've uh, personally implemented uh, that have allowed me to transition from the world uh, of full-time employment to, to that of uh, full-time freelancing successfully. 
So uh, this session is called Five Figure Freelancing. And as you probably imagine, I'm here to talk about something that's often a heavily guarded secret and, and a taboo topic in, in society today. Right? I'm, I'm here to talk about money, uh, and specifically how you can earn uh, at least $10,000 or, or, or five figures per month uh, as a freelancer, you know, designer, uh, developer, or, or whatever field you happen to be an expert in. So uh, if you learned one thing about me today, I want it to be this. I believe transparency trumps secrecy. And, and with that said, I want to be fully transparent with you here. So these are my uh, take home earnings over the last 12 months uh, as a freelancer, right? Just north of, of the $150,000 mark. Um, if you made less money than this over the last 12 months, I'd really like you to stick around and listen to what I have to say. Uh, I honestly believe I could teach you something uh, that will help you earn more money over the next 12 months. Uh, and if you earn more money than this over the last 12 months, I'd like you to stick around too. Let's meet up after the session. I'll, I'll buy you a coffee, maybe something stronger. Uh, I would, I'd love to hear your story. Uh, okay, so, so before we dive in uh, head first into to how to earn this much money uh, as a freelancer, it's important we, we step back and, and we, we set some goals. Uh, so uh, obviously we know we're striving for the, the $10,000 a mark each month. And, and that translates to the 120,000 per year. Uh, but these are huge uh, elephant size numbers, right? And, and we can't eat the elephant in one bite. We need to eat the elephant one bite at a time. So in order to do that, uh, we need to break down this monthly number into smaller bite-sized goals. Right? We'll start with uh, a weekly goal, break that down to a, a daily goal and, and then an hourly goal. So uh, you'll notice we have an asterisk uh, next to the daily goals. It might be hard to see in the back. Um, and, and there's a question mark next uh, or under hourly. And that's because these, these goals uh, will fluctuate a bit uh, depending on uh, how much or how little you decide that you'd actually like to work. So uh, for example, if your goal is to earn $10,000 uh, next month, uh, you need to ask yourself, you know, do I plan on working every single day? Or, or do I only want to work Monday through Friday? And there's, there's no wrong answer here. This is just personal preference. So once you've decided how many days you'd like to work, then the next step is to figure out uh, how many hours you'd like to work each day. So these examples that I have here uh, are based off of eight hours paid work, whether you decide that, that seven days or five days, or maybe something else is, is uh, appropriate for you. Um, if you decide that you don't want to work eight hours a day, maybe you want to work four hours a day, what well, would we'll just do some simple math? Double these numbers. If you want to work two hours a day, double them again. So there's no right or, or wrong answer here, right? Um, but we need to set some goals. Uh, you wouldn't start a marathon without knowing where the finish line is, right? So let's set a daily goal uh, and understand how many uh, working hours or, or paid working hours we need to put in that day and at which rate so that we can actually uh, achieve these goals and, and, and cross our daily finish line. Uh, and once we have the, these uh, goals defined, the next step is, is to hold ourselves accountable for them every day. And, and the accountability is, is equally as important as, as setting the goals, if not more important. Right, so the truth is, uh, becoming a successful freelancer is not a, a line item to, to check off your to-do list. Uh, but rather a, a bunch of small daily wins stacked uh, one on top of another uh, over and over and over again. Oop. A little click happy, sorry guys. Uh, so becoming more successful will, will require you to, to both set uh, and measure goals on, on a daily basis. So we can look at this from, from a non-freelancing angle for a moment. Uh, and let's take weight loss or, or getting fit, for example, right? So most people fail because they go out and they simply buy a gym membership or, or they buy a book, they read a book, uh, and that's all they do, right? They, they fail to make steady, measurable progress forward every day. And since they're not tracking their personal progress on, on a daily basis and, and holding themselves accountable, they start looking for the confirmation in the mirror. And when they don't see it, they just give up. They, they throw in the towel. So there's, there's no magic pill or magic powder that's just magically going to give us this, this overnight success. And it's true whether you're looking to get fit or, or grow your freelancing business. So until you have a plan and a system to hold yourself accountable, you won't be any more productive 
and you won't be any more profitable. Right? The good news here is that the, the personal accountability system doesn't have to be time consuming or, or stressful. Uh, personally, my, my uh, accountability system doesn't take me more than a, a few seconds each day. I've created a few uh, simple spreadsheets to, to track my progress, uh, and I'd, I'd encourage you to do the same as well. So this is, this is what the, the spreadsheets look like. It might be tough to see in the back. Um, but I, I'm tracking just a few simple metrics. I, I've got uh, the date that the project was open, so that's a client's down payment, who the client actually is, uh, what their final payment date uh, was, uh, what that total payment uh, amount was, where this lead came from, uh, and, and uh, uh, or the referral source, where the lead uh, came from. So it's not enough to simply uh, set these uh, goals we have, to, we have to measure them uh, and hold ourselves uh, accountable. Uh, let me backtrack and explain. These are two uh, separate spreadsheets. Uh, so I have my daily progress, uh, which, which then uh, in the bottom uh, left you see uh, is compounded into to weekly statistics, and then the weekly uh, is brought over into these monthly, quarterly, and, and, and yearly stats. And I would encourage all of you to, to create a simple spreadsheet like this. Uh, if you add the, the data to this uh, on a project-by-project -project basis, it, it really only takes you a few seconds. Uh, okay, so, uh, like I said, it's not uh, enough to just simply set goals. We must also measure them and, and hold ourselves accountable. So I knew going in, into my uh, freelance career that I wanted to earn uh, $100,000 per year, which meant I needed to bring home, uh, for the sake of round numbers, 275 bucks a day. Uh, and, and here's how I did uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, and how do I know this? Well, I know this because I held myself accountable and, and logged my progress on a project-by-project -project basis every single day. Uh, and as you can see, my track record uh, for goal completion last year is, is far from perfect. And that's okay. You don't have to go 100% uh, on your daily goals to reach a, a weekly, monthly, or, or yearly goal. And that's an important lesson to learn. Right? We, we can't get discouraged over uh, some daily failures. If we look at this from a professional athlete's perspective, uh, there's a baseball player, professional baseball player, <clears throat> whose name is Ty Cobb. Uh, and he's in the, uh, the record books. He, he currently holds the record for the, the highest batting average of, of all time. But his batting average is far from perfect. He, he's just over one third. He's got a .366. So, you know, over his career, he had a little over 11,000 at bats, but only ended up with, you know, 4,000 uh, in change hits. And I'd imagine every time, you know, Ty stepped up to the plate, he told himself, I'm going to get a hit, I'm going to get on base. Um, but just like our daily goals in freelancing, it didn't always work out that way for him. So don't, don't get discouraged. Uh, just because you don't meet a, a daily goal doesn't mean you won't meet the weekly goal. And if you... Miss a weekly goal, it doesn't mean you can't hit a monthly goal. And even if you miss a few of your monthly goals, you can still hit your yearly goal, right? And, and I'm living proof of this. These, these are literally the statistics from last year uh, of, of my uh, goal completion. Uh, the swings in, in this goal completion uh, represent swings in income as well. Uh, so income as a freelancer is, is uh, a bit of a roller coaster. You know, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's it's fairly inconsistent. Uh, and the numbers at the bottom of this slide, which uh, I guess purple is quite hard to see on this, um, <laughs> they represent the, the very best and worst uh, income swings for me. So uh, my worst day uh, produced zero income. That's obvious, right? I mean, we wouldn't expect to, to earn some money every single day uh, as a freelancer. Uh, but what you don't see here is, is those zero dollar days actually happened for me uh, 108 times over the past 12 months. Uh, if you think about it, 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 that's about equal to having a real job you know, with, with uh, weekends off and, and holidays off. Uh, but on top of those 108 days, there were 93 where I earned some money, uh, but I didn't earn it enough to meet my goal. So on average, you know, I only achieve my daily goal 45% of the time, or three days a week, roughly. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, which you see under the daily, uh, this was on July 21st, I brought home uh, a little bit uh, north of the $3,000 mark. Right? And that's almost 12 times the daily goal that, that I set for myself. So what I'm really trying to say here is, you know, freelancing 
it is a bit of a financial roller coaster, and, and you have to be prepared for that going in. Uh, if you're wondering at this point, hey, how, how did you make 3,200 bucks in, in, in one day if you only charge 100 bucks an hour and there's only 24 hours in a day? Uh, well, that, that answer is simple. Uh, sometimes you, you complete projects uh, for clients and they take a few days to, to sign off or to, to give you your final payment. So on July 21st, uh, that happened six times. I had six clients uh, sign off on projects within one day. So uh, no cheat codes there. Uh, if we move to the weekly stats uh, quick, I've met uh, my goals 31 times out of, of uh, 52 weeks. Uh, unfortunately, I can't say the same for the other 21. Uh, well, I never had a zero dollar week. Uh, there was one week where, where I managed to earn just 400 bucks around uh, Christmas and, and New Year's. Um, and the best week I ever had was, was a little bit north of the <clears throat> $7,000 mark. That was last month, uh, July. So you can see there's, there's quite a difference in, in, in income, uh, even on a weekly basis uh, as a freelancer. Uh, moving on to monthly, uh, I went 10 for 12 there. Uh, my, my worst month was the first month I, I really started taking freelancing seriously. Um, it was about 6,500 bucks. Uh, and, and then the best month uh, was, was uh, July uh, last month, uh, which was just a little bit over uh, 21,000 uh, bucks. We talked about the yearly numbers uh, a little bit before. So instead of continuing to talk about these numbers, let's, let's dive into how these numbers uh, are, are possible. So the first thing you need to do to become a successful freelancer is to uh, identify uh, your niche, right? Your area of expertise. So we don't want to be a jack of all trades, uh, master of none. What I mean by that is you can't be an expert at everything. Right, so instead, focus uh, on becoming an expert at one thing. Uh, whether that's you know, design, uh, development, copywriting, photography, social media, uh, something else entirely. Pick one and do it very, very well. Uh, if it takes you more than uh, a few seconds to identify where you fit in here, uh, then it's time that you, you stop and, and sit back and think you know, about exactly what you're doing and, and why. So if you're taking on projects uh, in all of these areas, right, you're taking on uh, projects beyond your primary area of, of expertise, that's going to just cause you some unnecessary uh, and easily avoidable stress. Uh, conversely, as, as an expert in, in just one field, you command a much higher premium uh, for your efficiency and, and effectiveness. So if we go back to uh, the, the professional athlete uh, analogy from before, right, we, we have Ty Cobb, this, this professional baseball player, and he picked one sport. And, and he did play various positions over his career, uh, but he spent the majority of his, his defensive career in, in the outfield. So his, his micro uh, niches were you know, center field and, and right field. And, and there were also uh, some positions that he didn't play. Right? He never played catcher or he never played shortstop. Uh, not, not a single game in his, his career. Right? Uh, so he trusted others uh, to do that. On, uh, on defense, he mastered the outfield. On, on offense, he mastered uh, batting. <clears throat> so we can apply the same approach to freelancing. Once you've defined uh, your, your niche and uh, chosen your field of expertise, it's time to drill down even further. So personally, uh, I'm a developer. But that doesn't mean I take on every development project that, that comes my way. Right? So my average task size over the last 12 months uh, is just south of the $400 mark, uh, about 393 bucks. Uh, and, and I prefer solving many small problems rather than uh, just a few large ones. So uh, more often than not, the, the projects that I take on uh, are opened and closed within the same day. And following this strategy ha has allowed me to close more than 600 tasks uh, for more than 300 clients uh, during my first year as a freelancer. <clears throat> Earning more as a freelancer really revolves around three things. First is, is how many incoming leads can you get? Uh, second is how much do they cost you? And, and third, how quickly can you convert those leads into customers? So the objective uh, is to transition from actively chasing down any leads uh, to responding exclusively to inbound leads. And our goal is to have as big of a number as possible here in, in, in the first column. In terms of percentages, we're looking for 100%. Uh, 
Now, obviously, 100% inbound leads could be achieved quite easily just through some paid ads, right? Uh, anybody can do that. But the problem with the paid ads it, is exactly that. You, you have to pay for them, right? And, and, and the goal for the second uh, column here, how much do they cost, is to have as low of a number as possible. Right? Ideally, we want this to, to cost us nothing, besides maybe a little bit of time to, to actually respond uh, to the leads. And that brings us to, to uh, question number three. How quickly can we convert these leads into paying customers? So again, we want to have uh, as low of a number as possible here. Uh, zero is, is probably not realistic, um, but personally, uh, I'm willing to invest somewhere between five and, and 15 minutes into a project, depending on the budget and, and the scope uh, that, that you know, was initially submitted. So if, if the scope isn't clear to me uh, after that short time, I always propose a, a one hour paid consultation. And that'll quickly eliminate any clients that aren't serious uh, about paying for your help. And if you take it from me, this, this strategy does work. It, it certainly doesn't convert at, at 100%. But over the last 12 months, I've been taken up you know, on that, that one hour consultation many, many times. Uh, and more often than not, those consultations, once we clearly define the work, turn into an additional task where, where they then hire me to, to solve the problem that, that uh, I help them identify or uh, to, to scope out. So the bottom line here is, is if you're not offering a paid consultation, you're leaving money on the table. Uh, let's go back to the numbers. Earlier I mentioned I've, I've uh, closed 600 uh, plus tasks uh, over the last 12 months for 300 uh, unique clients. So the question shouldn't just be how, how do I earn more? But, but specifically, how do you get so many great leads for free? So here's what I did to, to increase my uh, inbound leads. I joined some uh, premium freelancing networks uh, and, and a few uh, affiliate programs. Uh, we can start with the, the freelancing network first. Uh, there's, there's hundreds of these platforms that you can join. Uh, and, and the first thing you need to understand is, is these platforms aren't created equally. Right? Uh, as with all things in life, each, each have their own uh, unique pros and cons. Uh, and I'd encourage you to spend some time researching each of these and, and research even uh, more of them to find uh, what the best fit is for you before you actively start participating in any of them. So over the last uh, 12 months, I've joined four of these networks, Codable, uh, Clarity, GoDaddy, uh, and, and the LinkedIn ProFinder. And, and joining these networks in, in combination with, with uh, the organic leads from my own personal portfolio uh, are now providing me with a nearly unlimited stream of, of incoming leads. Sometimes more work that, than I can handle myself. Uh, oftentimes more work than, than I can handle myself. And that's, that's a good problem to have as a freelancer. So, Let's talk a little bit about the, the freelancing networks and, and, and when you're actually uh, going to join them. So here's a, a couple uh, tips that I have for you. So the first off is, is determine the, the network uh, exclusivity. So is everyone accepted to this network? Is this an upwork or is it going to be a race to the bottom? Uh, or, or is there some sort of test like a, a top tell or a codable uh, that only brings in you know, the premium talent? Uh, two, does this network charge me anything? Right? And do they take a commission or, or not? Some do, some don't. Um, I've personally found that the, the networks that, that take the commissions um, <clears throat> have a much, uh, much better track record um, than, than, than those that don't. Um, I've had more failures on, on networks that don't. They, they're not invested in you as a freelancer. They're, they're just simply trying to connect the dots um, and then send you on your way. There's not really uh, much support. Uh, so that kind of brings us to three with the, the, the payment processing. Um, are you responsible for this as a freelancer, or is that network going to handle this payment processing for you? Uh, personally, I'm a huge fan of the networks that do uh, process these payments for you. Um, the, I've had, um, uh, I don't enjoy uh, calling anybody and asking them for money. I'm, I'm sure uh, no, there's not many of you that, that do it uh, either. So uh, if you join a network that, that process the payments for you, uh, I think it's going to be much more convenient. Um, do they have a dispute resolution procedure in place, right? If something goes wrong, something is bound to go wrong at some point, even over 600 clients, there's been a few uh, that haven't gone perfectly fine for me. 
right? And, and what do we do when that happens? Do, does the network help mediate this, or are you on your own? Uh, five, are you working with colleagues or, or, or competitors? And, and certain networks, they'll build a family, and everybody is willing to help one another, right? And, and then on other ones, it's this race to the bottom, and, and it's cutthroat, and, and those aren't the networks that I enjoy uh, participating in. Uh, so Codable, for example, uh, there's about 200 of us in this platform, and, and we're all colleagues, we're all friends, we help one another uh, try to grow uh, personally uh, as freelancers. So I'd encourage you to, to try to join networks uh, that will help build you up rather than, than uh, competing with everyone. Uh, six, are there any active member success stories, right? Is there somebody that, that can, can show you uh, how successful they've been on this network and, and, and uh, do you believe them? Uh, on to the uh, affiliate programs. This, this is another uh, nice passive stream of income. Uh, but I think there's certainly uh, right ways and, and wrong ways to, to join these uh, affiliate networks. So I've joined two of these over the last year, uh, and I've done that uh, on purpose. They're uh, the WP Engine uh, referral program and uh, another one called Referoo, which is uh, just used to, to direct traffic back to, uh, to Codable. So when you join an affiliate program, do you actively use this product or service already? Right? Would you use it anyway, even if they didn't have an affiliate program? Right? If the answer is no, you probably shouldn't join that one. Uh, two, don't, don't be a spammer. Don't offer uh, your clients unsolicited advice. Not everyone needs that product. Right? Just because you're going to make 200 bucks from it doesn't mean they need it. Right? Uh, three, be transparent with your clients. Let them know, hey, look, I, I'm an affiliate of, of, of this company. They scratch my back a little bit when you sign up for them. I found that oftentimes clients respect me more uh, when I tell them this, and they're, they're glad that they're helping me out as well. Uh, and, and four is, is uh, a little unrelated, but if you're going to try to send some traffic there from, from your own portfolio, uh, produce some quality content. Don't just, uh, again, spam you know, all the, the WP Engine links uh, or whatever uh, across your blog, right? Deliver an article that, that has some substance, that can provide some value to the client rather than just uh, looking to, to pad your own pockets. Uh, if we look at the income distribution, uh, curve across these networks to so see uh, there's the vast differences in, in, in uh, my world. It, it, so it's, it's important to understand that, that these networks uh, aren't created equally. And when you find one that works well for you, uh, I'd encourage you to focus your energy there. As you can see, that's exactly what I've done with Codable. Right? They're responsible for 88.6% of, of, of my income. Uh, over the last year, and their referral program is another one and a half, so we're actually over 90%. Uh, my eggs are in the, the codable basket right now. So now that you've joined some of these networks, what do you do next? Right? We need to develop a strategy of, of how we're going to get these clients and, and, and how we're going to uh, earn some more money. So think of these as um, you know, building a systematic approach to earning more as, as a freelancer. I think these are guidelines um, and, and not so much as rules. Uh, but one, but before you dive in headfirst into freelancing, make sure you have enough money saved to do this. Right? It, things can go wrong. And, and, and uh, if that happens, if, if you don't have any more clients tomorrow, how long can you pay your bills? Can you keep the lights on for one month? Can you keep the lights on for a year? That's personally what I did. I, I was working in an agency job that I didn't really like. But uh, I continued saving my money for the first six months that I worked uh, on this network. And I took 50% uh, took of the, the income that I made aside. And, and after six months, uh, there was number two, build your street cred. Uh, what I mean there is, is when you join these networks, you'll have uh, a big fat zero on your, your uh, profile, right? How many tasks has uh, Nathan completed? Zero. Well, why should I work with him, right? So, my strategy there was, was to communicate with as many clients as possible and to communicate with as, as, as many small tasks as possible. Right? So I wanted to get these numbers up as quickly as I could because I would see these guys that have 500, 600 tasks completed and they're winning these jobs w without hardly having to communicate with these clients. So how can I get there? Well, to build my street cred. Uh, three, once you have a client working with you, retain them. Right? This, that's good business. 
encourage direct connections. Give them a link directly back to you. Give them your email address, your phone number, whatever, you know, however you prefer to work. Uh, personally, I don't like phone calls at all, but <laughs> some of you do. Uh, so encourage your clients to, to connect with you directly, especially if you had a good experience. I mean, uh, from the client's perspective, if uh, finding a developer can be challenging, or finding whatever uh, you're an expert in can be challenging. So just encourage them to continue working with you, uh, and, and that repeat business uh, will grow over time. Uh, and, and now I'm at the point where I'm only, uh, well, not 100%, but like 95% uh, is, is, is recurring business for me. So these clients are just coming back for, for more and more and more work, and I have people just waiting in line uh, for this work to get done. Four, uh, never work for free, ever. With the exception of that five or ten minutes that you're actually going to talk uh, to somebody to try to uh, uh, scope out the work with them, um, oh, oh. besides that initial uh, few moments, uh, I never work for free. Push them into that paid uh, consultation. If they're not going for it, move on to the next client. If they do, I'll draw you able to turn them into to, uh, a larger project. Uh, five, charge what you're worth. That's a huge problem in the freelancing world right now. It's probably the biggest problem we have is undervalued services. Right? So, charge more. That, that's <laughs> simple as I can put it. Uh, six, suggest some other improvements, right? So once, once you've worked with the client, um, maybe you've solved one small problem for them and, and you've identified, hey, th this is something else you could do better. Let me help you with that. So don't suggest 20 more improvements, which, which will overwhelm them and, and odds are they won't hire you for any. But suggest one or two, you know, maybe some performance optimization uh, or, or something small that, that you think they could do just a little bit better. Uh, and odds are, you'll, you'll end up with another task from them. Uh, seven, learn how to say no. That's, that's pretty straightforward. If there's something that's not directly aligned with your skill set, tell them, tell them no, you can't do that. Uh, I would encourage you to, to grow your network, number eight. Uh, and so when you have to say no to somebody, you can say no, but uh, and then refer them to, to someone else, right? So maybe you're a developer and they ask for some design work or they ask for some copywriting and that's, that's you know, not what you're passionate about. Go ahead and just refer them to somebody else. Try to connect the dots for them and, and have those people that you refer the work out to refer the work back to you, right? So, so grow this network. Um, surround yourself with, if we went back to that grid with, with all the different skill sets, surround yourself with as many people from as, as many different skill sets uh, as you can. And even as a developer, there's other developers that, that work you know, in a little different space than you. Uh, partner with those guys too, right? And, and just send work back and forth. Uh, and number nine, very important, uh, actually put in the work, right? So if you're not going to show up and you're not going to actually do some work, you're not going to make any more money, right? You have to show up. You have to work. Okay, once, once we've got our, our system in place and, and we start printing some money, uh, you might ask yourself, well, what's next? And, and I'd encourage you to start giving back to, to the community. And there's all sorts of different ways uh, you can do this. And, and these are just uh, a few ideas for you. But, but number one, uh, certainly the least expensive, release some of your code open source. Whether that's a new plugin or, or a theme or, or something else you've created, this is one of the easiest, cheapest ways you can give back to the, the community. Uh, if you're not a developer, maybe number two is more appropriate for you. Volunteer, speak at, at some industry-related events. Right? Share your knowledge with, with others. Share your knowledge with your peers. Uh, again, this doesn't have to be a tremendous expense. You don't need to take two planes uh, for seven hours to come from, from the States to Canada. Right? You can just go to a local event. Speak at a local event first. Uh, and third, you can donate some of your time. Right? You can work on projects uh, pro bono. Personally, I, I've donated some of my time over the last year uh, to, to an organization that I believe in. They're, they're called the United Heroes League, uh, and they keep uh, military kids in, in sports. So they're providing them with the, the equipment to, to continue playing. So that's something you can do. You can give, you can give some time back. There's, there's really no right or, or wrong way to give back. Just figure out what you're most comfortable with and, and do that. Okay, so let's backtrack uh, just a little bit uh, to that awesome strategy we developed. In, instead of looking into the future um, and finding ways to, to give back, let's focus on, on actually making the transition into freelancing. Right? So to do that, we need to take this calculated uh, leap of faith. Uh, does anybody know what animal this is? 
This is a gazelle, right? And if, if you're not familiar with the gazelle, uh, let me be the first to tell you these are some pretty incredible animals. Some of them uh, can reach speeds of, of 60 miles an hour or 100 uh, kilometers an hour. But, but even more impressive uh, than the gazelle's speed is its ability to jump. Right? So, so gazelles use their back legs to, to spring themselves nearly 10 feet into the air, almost uh, 3 meters, or a little over uh, 3 meters. Uh, so visualize that. I mean, if you gave a gazelle a basketball, he could pretty much dunk. At full speed, uh, when they jump, that's they'll land nearly 30 yards from where they took off. I mean, that's a massive jump. They, they could jump across this room. So the image that we see here is a typical gazelle habitat at the zoo. And you notice there's a very, very short fence, right? Three feet, one, one meter tall fence. So why in the world would a zoo enclose an animal with, with the ability to jump so high and, and so far with a fence that's so short. Well, that's because if the gazelle is raised in captivity, it doesn't know it can jump over that fence. Right? So while it could clear that fence threefold, it's never tried. So the moral of the story is you can't do something if you don't try. And you definitely can't do something if you assume, I can't do that. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time is, is from Henry Ford, and, and he says, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree with him more. So if you're anything like me, you probably grew up with, with some pressure to you know, go to school, uh, get that degree, go get a real job, right? And, and those are the short fences that, that you could easily clear if, if only you tried. So if I can persuade you to do one thing here today. It, it would be to jump. Jump into the world of freelancing and, and never look back. Thank you. Uh, my slides are available if you want, you want to take a look through the deck uh, on my website or, or uh, read what I had just said. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for, for some questions if, if, if there are any. So. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'm happy to answer anything. Yes? Do you track your earnings when you when, when the client writes the check or when it's perspective? So uh, how it works for me uh, through the Codable platform is, is clients prepaid for all of their work, right? So, so step one is I'm going to estimate the, the project. And then if that's aligned with the client's expectations, the client puts 100% into escrow. So um, I, I will go ahead and, and complete the work. Most of the time, I, I just do the, the small tasks, um, and, and so we don't have to do milestones. And, and if that's the case, then, then I'll get paid as soon as the work is complete. So um, I, I'm putting those numbers into the spreadsheet uh, initially when they open the project, because I know how much that project is worth. right? Uh, but I'm not actually collecting that money until the, the project is 100% complete. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? In the back? How much time are you also spending on the little and the various things and the, the unbillable stuff? Uh, sure. Can you give me a specific example of, of something unbillable? I mean, I almost try to bill for everything. Well, actually, well, I guess at this point, clients are approaching you, but actually, you mentioned you know, the five to ten minutes for the pitches. Like, how, does, how does all that sort of add up? Like, if you're working eight billable hours a day, Sure. Uh, so the, the platform that I work for, uh, primarily again, Codable, we have the individual workrooms set up for, for each client. So I'm, I'm not really answering any emails at this point. Uh, I mean, I've got all these incoming leads coming into one centralized platform where I'm able to, to manage my communication uh, with the client. So aside from the, the few seconds that it takes me uh, to, to enter my information into the spreadsheet, I, I don't really spend a, a lot of time on, on any of that. And, and I think that was a big difference. You know, I've, I've uh, been in the freelancing world a few times, and I wasn't so successful in, in my other bouts. And that was because I was uh, actively trying to pursue these leads, right? I was trying to convince people that you needed this. And any time that you tell somebody, hey, you need this, they say, no, I don't, right? And so that, that was quite a challenge. So 
Um, I would encourage you to join these platforms. Try to uh, get as many incoming leads as you can. You have to remove yourself from that unbillable time, right? We, we have to try to bill every waking minute that we possibly can if we're going to earn this much money as a, as a freelancer. Um, is, that, is that helping at all? I mean, my, my answer is I don't really spend any time or uh, significantly less time than, than most, you know, working on, on anything like that. So if I'm not being paid for my time, I don't put my time into it more than just a few minutes. So I try to avoid unpaid phone calls, I mean, anything. Yes? How much time do you spend uh, refining your skills, upgrading and so on? Sure. I, I mean, I've, I've been at this for 10 years, like I said. So uh, I think if you, you started you know, d developing yesterday, then maybe we need to set a little bit more realistic expectation. And, and there's going to be a curve here to ramp up uh, to actually uh, getting to, to this level. Um, but I mean, you have to continue your education uh, every day, right? I mean, if, if we're not moving forward, we're moving backwards. So I'm, I'm trying to learn something new every day. I, I mean, every opportunity I possibly have. And that might be from my colleagues. That might be uh, something that uh, you know I, I started with a client and, and I solved one problem, but then uh, they came to me and said, "Hey, I have this. Maybe I have to learn a little bit more about that, you know, specific uh, widget or, or plugin, so that I'm able to solve that problem." So uh, I'm learning every day. Yes. I'm assuming in your 10 years experience, you've probably spent a portion of that where you were doing it all from content strategy. Sure, to, yeah, absolutely. So could you could you elaborate more on what happened with your peace of mind and just stress when you went from trying to do it all to specializing? Sure, yeah. I mean, when you specialize, your stress level decreases tremendously. You're not doing anything that you don't want to do anymore, right? So maybe at the start of your career, they're saying, hey, I need this design, this development, and this copywriting, and you're like, oh my goodness, I don't want to do two thirds of that, right? And, and, and you kind of are at first, you notice, hey, I'm really stressed, I, I don't like this, and I don't like that, but here's the one piece that when I'm working on this, I am just truly passionate about this. I love developing, and I don't like these other pieces, right? And, and, and so as I uh, transition from trying to be that jack of all trades, master of none, into the master of one, my stress level has decreased tremendously. And, and you know, I've, I've uh, created new relationships with, with designers and, and copywriters and, and the social media guys. Um, and, and, and they can take on the work that, that I'm not excited about. So I would encourage you to do the same. Build your network. Yes? How important is it to maintain kind of a work-life balance? Um, when oh, you start three minutes <laughs> and the money comes in and it's like, oh, I don't have to go to date night, you know, with my partner. I can stay up late and make X amount more. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, you're yeah. Um, and uh, hey, that's a, that's a great question. That's very real. And and for me, like my background, I didn't come from uh, a wealthy family uh, or anything like that. So once I started uh, earning more money. Like, that's all I set my sights on, right? And, and there was no work-life balance. It was just work, 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 right? And even on the, the vacation to WordCamp Europe, it was like, well, how many tasks can I get done while I'm over here, right? And so eventually, you, you have to put your foot down, and you have to find that, that work-life balance. And I think it's going to take a little bit of time uh, to find it, to ramp up to that. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and it, it certainly uh, applies to me. Uh, because I, I put in well more than, than the eight hours initially, and I was putting in seven days a week trying to ramp up to this point. Yes? Can you elaborate on when you're talking to the clients and you're establishing the scope of the project and you're, you're thinking, oh, I don't understand what they want to do, they're not clear. Just that whole segue into the paid hour, or perhaps it needs to be a paid five hours, and how do they pay for that? You're obviously the prepaid. Sure. Yeah. So um, with those those pain consultations, I, I try to bring that to the client's attention as early as I can. Right. It, it, once I hit that that five or ten minute mark, where where we're not uh, real clear on what's what's uh, going to be delivered, you have to you have to say, hey, look, uh, this isn't clear to me, or, or uh, you you're not uh, the scope of work that you've defined isn't quite. Uh, proper for, for somebody like me to understand 
what it is that you want. And, and let me help you understand that. Let me help you define this. And I'm not saying you have to work with me. Let's spend an hour together. Let me help you write a better project brief and so that any other developer can understand the problem and, and, and what needs to be solved. Um, and, and then sometimes they hire you, sometimes they don't. Uh, I, I never do more than an hour paid consultation. There, I, I work on a lot of smaller projects, so maybe if you're on some super uh, huge corporate $30,000 site, it, it's going to take more uh, discovery time, right? Um, I haven't been in that, that situation. Uh, there's two platforms that I use for the consultations. One is uh, Codable. That will be a flat fee hourly, uh, 60 bucks, right? And I'll give you an hour of my time. Or there's another platform, Clarity, uh, it's clarity.fm, uh, and it's a, it's a phone call based service, and they charge per minute. So sometimes clients say, oh, I only need you know, five minutes of your time, or I think I only need 15 minutes, and, and they'll try to sign up for this, you know, two bucks a minute to, to talk to you. Uh, and oftentimes that ends up going longer. Uh, but I'll offer them both, you know, tell them, hey, we can, we can go through Clarity, you can uh, talk to me per minute, or we can, we can do a flat fee hour. So you never do anything outside of those platforms, just on your own? No, no, often. I mean, when I get uh, a lead that comes through my own portfolio, I drive it back to one of these networks. I like working through Codable. Uh, I have the, the referral program set up with them, too, so that the commission that they take, uh, I'm only losing a, a very small portion. And I think the 5% the that I end up giving to this network is well worth it for me not to wear that accounts receivable hat, right? So they're going to process all, uh, the transactions for me. That's worth 5% to me all day. Yes? Once you establish the scope, how do you do with estimating how long it's going to take and what happens when it either goes over or under your estimate? Sure. So you have to communicate with the clients. You have to educate the, the clients about the process, right? So if you're not 100% sure that you can solve that problem in one hour, two hours, four hours, whatever it is, tell that to them. And, and honestly, I'll, I'll tell the clients, hey, uh, sometimes there's things that come up that, that I don't know that I don't know. And, and, and so I thought it was going to be two hours, and here's what happened, and here's why it happened. And I can solve that too, but it's going to actually take another two hours. And, and most of the time, uh, the overwhelming majority of the time, the clients are okay with that. And they say, oh, I understand. Thanks. Thanks for explaining that to me, Nate. Um, bill me for another two hours. I agree. There's times where, where clients are the opposite. Uh, it happens less, but it does happen. And you eat that time, unfortunately, uh, as a freelancer. So, I mean, you kind of have the option, uh, fire the client, give them their money back, or finish the project, right? And, and I finish the project. Do you have Yeah, a little bit, of course, right? I mean, you have to have a buffer. So, and, and then sometimes if it takes a little bit less time than the buffer, you've got a bonus. And, and Sometimes you take the whole buffer, and so it is kind of an average, right? So some, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but the average is, is, is even. Okay, I think that's about all the time we have. If any of you have any more questions, find me. I'll be here all day. Love to talk to you about freelancing. Thank you.